Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk a bit about the, uh, the development of the time usage model for, for underground mining. Uh, I'm not planning on reading off the slides. Everybody here can read and you've had a copy. So I just wanted to speak to it a little bit more. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the, the, the starting point of this it was or is that there was a time usage model developed for open pit mining. Um, and, and overall, that's a fairly common concept uh, for anybody involved in, in open pit mining. Um, you know, the reason there that the guideline was prepared was to really be able to compare apples to apples by, you know, suggesting some standards and, uh, you know, what do you call this? What do you call that? Um, you know, we actually heard from Heather yesterday that, uh, you know, there's there's been some really good feedback received on the, the surface time usage model, um, specifically actually within organizations where we where they can actually use it to to standardize when they have multiple operations, how they actually measure and report out and, and compare their various operations. So next step then is naturally to take that underground and, uh, and that's you know what we started attacking uh, recently. Um, yeah, you know, and obviously with uh, with the objective of eventually putting out some guidelines with uh, with recommendations towards uh, some standardized uh, nomenclature and and approaches on how to develop um, such such a model. Now, um, obviously, underground mining is is quite different from from open pit mining, um, and so we're we're in that phase right now, the definition phase, which is sometimes. You know, it, it, it comes across as a bit of a confusing phase, but that's just because there are so many definitions out there, so many opinions, and it's usually that part of the project actually that that takes a good chunk of time uh, to get you know everybody aligned before we actually start moving in the in the right direction. Um, you know, similar to to what we see in an underground time usage model, uh, we'll we'll be looking at something that you know covers. 24 hours of uh, any any kind of open pit operation, um, and then how we are going to 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 measure and um, uh, really record the data or collect the data to to be able to uh, develop the uh, the appropriate uh, KPIs. Uh, I think we can maybe move over to the next slide, uh, Heather. Obviously, we it's, as part of this, we want to gather a lot of information from the various subject matter experts out there that you know, are probably doing something in uh, in, in this form already at uh, at their existing operations, um, and it has a very very close relation with the the short term interval control. Um, we've seen that in the past that uh, some of that has uh, has already been developed by GMG. Um, you know, I, I kind of like to think of short-term interval control as obviously very, very similar to what your fleet management or fleet management system in an open pit environment uh, will be, um, with with the difference that you know the underground environment you don't have that visual that uh, that you can have in an open pit, uh, especially in in not having the uh, the presence of a GPS system, for example. And so the short-term interval control is sort of that uh, you know that that. Um, Air traffic control for your underground mine to uh, to allow your operation to work uh, to address you know whatever whatever comes up uh, during the shift. Uh, I mean anybody who works in an underground environment uh, probably knows that your shift uh, never ends the way that you had planned to start it. There's always something that happens that uh, that you need to. Uh, that's why the whole purpose of this short-term interval control is to you know, really be able to respond to that. Um, you know, as, as rapidly and as, as efficiently as possible. Now, in doing that, and in the various systems that uh, that have been developed to support short-term interval control, there is that opportunity then to actually start, um, you know, really measuring what is happening or what is not happening during your shift and during that that 24-hour period um, that uh, that you have available in, in each and every day. Um, but what we're seeing is that obviously in in an underground environment, um, you're not necessarily um, you know looking at the same things as you would in an open pit environment. Um, open pit is very much about material movement. 
which requires machines. And so machines move. And you want those machines to be moving as much as possible, um, waiting or idling as uh, as little as possible. So, and that's you know typically what your fleet management system uh, tries to do. Uh, in an underground mine, it's not not quite the same because first of all, underground mining is much more selective than open pit is, right? So you know there's there's a little bit more uh, uh, sort of picking and choosing on what material that you actually have to break and uh, and and remove. And there's a lot of activities around that to either prepare for that, support that, or or you know finish up um, afterwards. Um, that is that is in very very general terms, obviously what underground mining is. Um, and then what you may notice as you listen to me talk is that I've kind of been raised in the long haul mining environment. Um, so sort of naturally a lot of my uh, my thinking and talking goes towards that. But what we've already identified is that you know there's there's other mining methods underground as well. Um, you know, block cave. We had some really good discussions about that last week. On you know, a, a block cave uh, operation is still quite different than a um, than a long or sloping. Uh, and then there's cut and fill. And you know, I mean, can't forget about long uh, long uh, long wall uh, coal mining, for example. So lots lots out there. So we need to take that into consideration already, right? So that we're not honing in too much on one specific mining method, um, and 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 thereby actually. Um, Sort of ignoring some of the other mining methods that uh, that exist throughout the world as well. Um, so that's uh, that's really a, a, quite a big one. And then uh, one of the other parts as well that we've we already spoken about a lot is that in an underground environment, um, it's not necessarily just about keeping all the equipment moving um, as much as possible uh, because it's such a selective process because the activities that are happening with that equipment are typically of a much shorter duration than you will see in an underground environment. Um, so taking an, an open pit uh, time uses model directly underground um, may, may make it appear as if an underground mine is highly inefficient because that equipment isn't moving all the time. Um, but that's exactly why you know, we need to do some adaptations to the, uh, the time usage model and really think about, for example, you know, you obviously need some personnel on that equipment as well to be able to to move it around. But more importantly, you need that worksite to be available as well. Um, so that that stope, uh, not, I'll, I'll call it stope. You know, it may be a heading, it may be a draw point, it may be a, 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 another type of phase. Um, really, those are sort of the main resources that uh, that constitute uh, an underground mining process: a piece of equipment, uh, an operator on that equipment, and then uh, a site to put that equipment to work. So, um, you know, this is obviously what uh, what the mine planning engineers try to deal with uh, a lot. But there's that other level of complexity in that you know the the footprint or the, the real estate. In an underground mine is uh, is pretty small. Just focusing in, for example, on the main mining activities of you know drill, blast, muck, fill um, seems relatively straightforward, and it you know one comes after the other. But there's a lot of other processes around uh, in in the mine as well um, that may actually cause some conflict, but they still need to be done. Whether it's you know installing fans, uh, doing some time drilling, uh, rehab, cable bolting, um, you name it. So all of those things, uh, you know, how they they um, how they are carried out throughout the shift, um, and 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 how we plan for that is what we're trying to capture in that time usage model in an effort to have that 24/7 coverage of understanding what is happening and what is not happening in your mining operation. Um, there's obviously a link as well to and I'll say the processing facilities right now, which is you know sort of the client specifically, if you're not dealing with a um, uh, with you know a stockpiling situation or or a course or bin, for example. Um, but but in addition as well, actually in an underground environment, there is typically a lot more fixed equipment that is part of the process as well. Whether it's a shaft, a conveyor, um, you know it could even be a train 
that is either running underground or on surface to bring ore from uh, from A to B. Um, all those things that uh, that impact or can impact the efficiency of, of your operations as well. Uh, and last and but not least, um, cannot forget about the backfilling process. That is obviously one thing that is majorly different between an open pit operation and underground because those holes that are being made typically need to be filled up as well before you can move on to the next one. Um, and, and, and for that matter, just as, uh, as critical. Um, lastly, as I said, you know, we've, we've been doing a lot of uh, talking about sort of those, those three elements that you need to constitute a mining process, a machine, an operator, and, uh, and a worksite. Now, obviously, with, with technology advancing, uh, we're seeing you know, autonomous equipment becoming available as well, which you know, kind of actually takes that operator out of the picture or partially out of the picture. Uh, but it adds another element to it, which is, and I'll, I'll generalize it as the technology, the technology that still needs to be available and, uh, and, and functional for that autonomous equipment or remote equipment to, uh, to work. Um, so yeah, that's that's you know largely what this project about is how do you capture all of that in a standardized time usage model um, that that captures you know those various resources, but specifically as well captures the um, the variety of mining up the type of mining operations that exist on the ground. Um, so then for in terms of uh, obviously people getting involved, as I said, you know, when, when you only get a few people that do a lot of talking, um, you know, you end up potentially uh, skewing the results of something like this. So really the more people we can get involved that come from a, uh, with a, a variety of, of backgrounds when it comes to uh, underground mining operations, the, the better that we can do this um, for the purpose of you know, building the appropriate uh, measurements and and statistics, um, potentially, as I said, linked with that short term interval control, um, so that we better uh, understand, you know, what what is considered uh, efficient or, or what is most efficient. Um, you know, if you put if you put Canadians versus uh, Australians, there is always the debate about do you put a rock, do you put a bolter in there, or just do everything with uh, with your jumbo bolter. That uh, that debate still hasn't been uh, settled. For example, um, uh, I was going to say not about it slipped my mind now, but uh, there's there's a number of ones out there. Right, sorry, the one that we talked about a lot as well. So when you're in a long haul operation, for example, when you're doing that long haul drilling, when that drill is done or it's done that first part, do you now pull it out and walk it all the way to another part of the mine to start drilling again, or do you pull it out and park it off to the side so you can do that blast and put it back to work, right? People are always so hesitant to park it because it, it, it comes across as inefficient. But it, is it truly right? Or is that moving it to another site, putting it to work and now actually not having it available for that initial stove uh, actually potentially less efficient? Um, you know, obviously, then with this, you know, we, we, we hope to be able to establish a, a better understanding of the, uh, the needs for, uh, for underground equipment what type of equipment and, and you know the size of the fleet that uh, that is required um and obviously help as well in in the schedule management as i said just just scheduling for drill blast muck fill um is simply too to simplify it um and and you know anybody that tries to do that know that you you will never make uh, very good friends with your mine superintendent because there's just too much else going on um, and which, as I said right now, is, is largely being managed through that short-term interval control. Um, and obviously, then you know, our OEMs that uh, that we rely on heavily. I mean, it's a relatively small group of uh, of people. So, but the, the good thing about that is that you know we we can kind of focus our our efforts and, and discussions on that large group, a small group of of OEMs, so that uh, you know by uh, that we can collaborate on you know uh, working towards the next generation of, of appropriate equipment. Um, so yeah, so really some of the main considerations in this model, as I said, it's the usage of the equipment, but also understanding how that impacts the stope cycle. Um, because you know, that stope cannot move, you typically only have one or two access to, to get to that stope. Um, and so we're seeing that actually is a very important resource to, to be managed or tracked in the time usage model. 
Um, and then, as I said, that full, full cycle. Uh, and it's not just, again, the drill blast muck. It's also the cycle of activities that need to be done ahead of that stove actually starting that process of, uh, of drill blast muck. Uh, 